Okay, hi everyone. Thanks again for joining. Uh, today I'm going to be going over part 2F, showing how the weak formulation of Cindy can improve your robustness to noise. And then I'll briefly be going over how to uh, identify implicit ODEs with the Cindy Pi optimizer and library. So, uh, I'm not going to explain what the weak formulation is here. I encourage you to read uh, papers from uh, Reinbold and Messenger and, and elsewhere um, about what, what this is. Uh, but I'll just show you how it can be used and how, how much of a, a benefit it can give you on robust data. Um, so we're going to define a new library, um, say PySindy library. And we're going to use the same library functions as before. So uh, we're going to use a quadratic uh, polynomial custom library. Uh, and the reason it has to be custom is just because uh, we're using this special PDE library, uh, but this is not uh, so important. So function names, group library function names. Um, we need to give it a temporal grid. I know this is not super clear right now, but I'll explain in a moment. We're going to say include a constant term in the uh, candidate library. And then uh, we're going to say use the weak form. So there's this flag weak form, and we set it to true. Uh, and so we're asking, so in general, this PDE library we would use for PDE data. But if we don't pass a spatial grid, uh, it'll just be used as a normal custom library. Uh, and what's nice about this is it has this extra parameter weak form uh, that allows us to use the weak formulation of Cindy. Uh, so we're just going to use a custom library of quadratic terms in x, y, and z and uh, ask, ask it to use the weak formulation. So that's our library. Um, uh, once again, we can, uh, let's just copy and paste the uh, noisy data over. So where did I de define it before? So let's uh, just copy and paste this over since we, we want to test this on actually noisy data. And we're going we're gonna to ramp up the noise a little bit more even than, uh, than before. So uh, once again, we do this. We define, uh, we add noisy no Gaussian noise to the training data. And um, we're going to add 10% uh, noise to the Lorenz data. Okay. And now uh, we need to actually, the weak form actually integrates uh, both sides of this equation. Uh, so we need to compute the integral of x dot. Uh, I'm not going to explain the details too much here. Uh, but basically, you need to do this conversion. Uh, where we uh, put in the training data with noise the, uh, the uh, time base of that training data and the library that we just defined. It will give us back this uh, x dot integral. Uh, we're going to then define our model as usual. Pass those uh, feature names x, y, z we've been using for Lorenz. Pass the optimizer, which um, we're just going to use simple sequentially threshold least squares. Once again, the default defaults to lambda of 0 0.1. Um, and uh, pass the feature library called ODE lib. Um, uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, um, actually, no, OK. Apparently uh, not passing this feature library in. Uh, okay, so um, so at some point we'll do that. Uh, first, actually, we're going to fit a model uh, without the weak form because actually we we want to compare how does the model do on this 10% noisy Lorenz data without the weak form, and then how does it do with the weak form? Um, so then uh, we're going to define the model without that uh, special library. It'll default to a quadratic polynomial library, so these are going to be equivalent libraries. Just one will be using the weak formulation and one won't. Um, and then uh, let's see. So we model.fit, xtrain, added noise, width time step, 
And uh, we're actually uh, going to use ensembling here to actually check the statistics of the two different types of models um, and, um, and see which, which is doing better sort of in an average sense. Um, so that's good. Uh, so that's, that's the normal Cindy results. And then uh, we're going to, uh, so let's save those, uh, those models that we generated with the ensemble. So, and then take, take the, uh, the average and the standard deviation of those uh, once again, as we did in the ensemble video. Let's copy this. Oops. Uh, good. And now um, we're going to fit the same thing, uh, but with our weak formulation. So now we pass. ODE library as our uh, feature library. And now we also need to change uh, model.fit to uh, pass the correct x dot. So we're using this x dot integral uh, as, our, as our x dot for the, f with for the weak formulation. So two changes. We need to uh, specify the, the feature library to be this weak formulation library. And we need to pass the correct x dot uh, to the model.fit. Uh, and once again, we, get, we can print that model and uh, compute all the ensemble stuff. So uh, let's just change all these to weak. Oops. Okay, so we have uh, the mean and standard deviation for a set of regular Cindy models and a set of weak formulation models on 10% Lorenz training data. Uh, and now we're just going to type plot ensemble results, which is that function we used earlier in the videos. Uh, so this is uh, mean regular, standard deviation regular, mean weak and standard deviation week. Hopefully that will run. Okay, uh, first thing you might notice is that before we even look at the, uh, the plots, is that the x dot, y dot, and z dot for the regular Cindy model is doing very poorly. This is 10% Lorenz noise. It's very noisy data using finite differences. Uh, so the fit is like totally off. It's totally screwing up all these coefficients. Uh, but the weak form is pretty much getting the model right. It's got a, a couple extra terms, uh, but it's basically reproducing the, the model above. So this, this already looks like it's doing a better job uh, by, by quite a fair margin. But actually, if we look at the plots uh, using ensembling, we see it's, it's really making a difference. Uh, so the left-hand side plot here, the first plot, is, um, is, is the plot generated for the regular Cindy models. Uh, for 20 different Cindy models that were created. And the other plot is the same thing, but using the weak formulation. And you can see basically none of the coefficients are uh, correctly identified, uh, even with the error bars. Uh, so this, is, this amount of noise is really giving regular Cindy models a problem, even when you average over many different models and you subsample and so forth. Uh, but the weak formulation stuff, uh, absolutely gets it perfectly right. So it's, um, it's getting the coefficient values just right for each of the candidate terms. And actually, even the error bars are fairly uh, small and hard to see here. Uh, so each of the models is, is really nailing it uh, and doing a great job getting the, um, getting the coefficients. Uh, so for these levels of high noise, the weak formulation can make a really big difference in giving you robustness to noise. Uh, so that's, that's all I wanted to show for the weak formulation. If you want some of the more technical details, I, <coughs> I recommend you check out the papers I mentioned. Um, and uh, this, this, these sorts of techniques continue to evolve. Uh, but this, this is a really good uh, thing to use in PyCindy if you're worried about this, this level of noise in your data. Uh, it really, really improves the robustness of things.
Uh, for, so from uh, here on, we're just going to briefly discuss implicit ODEs before we wrap up this video. Um, an implicit ODE is, is really quite sim simple. It's basically that you have a, a system of ordinary differential equations that depends on both x and x dot. Uh, so you can see like the Lorenz equations above, uh, all the terms on the other side don't depend on x dot, y dot, and z dot. And so this is a normal system of ODEs. Uh, but you might have a system like this 1D mickelson menten enzyme model where you actually have some, like, uh, some, some term in the denominator. And when you rearrange terms, you can actually see, you can write it as x dot equals 0 0.6 minus 3x minus 10 thirds x x dot. Uh, so actually, there are terms on the right-hand side of that equation uh, that actually are proportional to x dot itself. Uh, and for these sorts of terms, uh, we need this variant of Cindy called Cindy Pi, ser Cindy Parallel Implicit. Uh, and this has been implemented in uh, Pi Cindy. Uh, so for this, we're gonna have to um, load in some, some uh, a, a new system since Lorenz is not an implicit system. Uh, so let's just define um, a time base and uh, get, this, get this data running. And, and again, we're going to use this uh, mickelson menten uh, enzyme model here. So apologies, it's going to take a bit of time just to uh, code up the uh, solution to this problem. Oops. Okay, so we have some training data. Um, we're just going to use the same custom library as we did before, this quadratic polynomial library in, uh, in, in the uh, variables. Uh, we're going to use that for the library for x, but actually we then, with this method, actually builds a different library for terms depending on x dot. And then it tensors those libraries together to get all the combinations of terms that can occur between those two libraries. Uh, so the x dot library, uh, we're just going to use a simple identity library. So it's just going to uh, take all the linear terms of the uh, of the x dot variables, uh, and then um, so let's define our library. And once again, we're going to use the Cindy Pi library since this is an implicit equation. We use library functions equals library functions. This is that library functions we used earlier in the videos. Uh, and then it needs our x dot library functions. Uh, we're going to give it the time base. Uh, so this is an extra thing it needs because it has to compute x dot from x in various parts of the library. Uh, but this is sort of a, a technical detail not super important. And um, we're also going to say include the, uh, a bias term, since actually we can see the mickelson menten dynamics depends on, it has a constant term in the dynamics, so we want to include that in the library, that, that 0 0.6 in the library. Um, so um, now we define, so that, that's the CindyPy uh, library. We also want to define the CindyPy optimizer. So because the library is different, we have to uh, optimize, solve that optimization problem in a bit different of a way. So uh, that optimizer is just called CindyPy. And uh, we're going to use just some, a thresh, very small threshold. Um, we're going to increase the solver tolerance because uh, this tends to help. Uh, this is actually using a CVXPy routine. Uh, and uh, the defaults are a little low for our purposes. And then we'll uh, turn up the maximum iterations as well for the same reason. Uh, now we have a, a CindyPy library, CindyPy optimizer, and we can fit the, the model. So uh, we do our normal thing. Whoop. Define the optimizer. Um, define the feature library. 
uh, we also have to um, define the differentiation method for this uh, because actually it's important that we drop the endpoints um, of, of, uh, of the data because we, we sort of are computing the derivatives within the library. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the technical details here, but uh, this is just an extra line you need to put in when you fit the bottle. And then uh, for this, we'll, we'll just say the feature names are just called X, since we just have one variable for the Nicholson-Menten dynamics called X. Uh, and then uh, that's all done. We fit our training data we just defined. Um, and then we print the model. So. I almost certainly broke something, as usual. Uh, okay, so I misspelled differentiation. Perfect, okay. Okay, so this is the, uh, it's fitting the Mikkelsen-Menten uh, dynamics. Uh, okay, it's a little hard to tell with these names, so let's, um, let's actually define the library names so uh, this is a little easier to read. Uh, so this is going to be um, so the library names actually are the names of the terms that occur both in the x library and the x dot library. Uh, so if you remember, looks like this, linear terms, uh, mixed quadratic terms, uh, quadratic terms that are the same, so like x squared. And then, uh, so that's, that's the x library. And then the x dot library is just this lambda x um, sorry, it should be a plus. So let's try that. And um, it uh, should be called function names equals this. See if that's a little bit more legible for, uh, for viewers. Okay, much better. All right. So um, I want to point out it's actually fitting a model for each term that, that is in your candidate library. But importantly, we get this, this equation that says x dot is 0 0.6 minus 3x minus 10 thirds xx dot. If you scroll up here, that is exactly the equation we're expecting for the enzyme model, uh, which is great. Uh, but actually, we get all these other models because it's, it's fitting a model for every single term appearing in your candidate library. And so, um, this is nice, we get the right model, but you might have a question like, how do you actually choose which model to use at the end since you get back all these different models? Uh, and uh, I encourage you to read the Cindy Pi paper by uh, Kadirdin to actually understand how to choose these models a little better. Uh, one way you can do it is just choose like the sparsest model or the model that has the lowest mean squared error on a new testing trajectory. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways you might wanna choose a model, um, but this, this is a really powerful method and these, this wealth of models can also help you discriminate between uh, good and bad fits as well. So that's, that's how you can um, uh, use PySindy to identify implicit ODEs. Thanks for listening.